We have a good one for you tonight. Hello and welcome to this Sports Affinity webinar presented by the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. FJMC is the parent organization of over 200 conservative men's clubs around the world. FJMC has presented more than 100 webinars since the pandemic began. We work hard to provide value to our members and to the Jewish community in general. For example, FJMC offers you a unique and valuable opportunity to be part of something bigger than yourself, while also allowing you to feel significant and accepted for just as just you are. In our emails, we have started including instruction on how to add the FJMC public Google calendar to your own calendar, as well as a link to down, download a single event file that can be used to add that one event to your calendar. I'm Dave Kravitz with my co-chair, Danny Mando, and I will be hosting tonight. So we are going to mute everyone so we can enjoy the presentation. We'll be unmuting after presenters' remarks so we can take questions. If you are enjoying our webinars, please validate your support with a contribution to FJMC by going to fjmc.org slash donate. I'll put the link on chat. Click on in honor of, and then select affinity groups or webinar. So it's now my pleasure to introduce to you, Nate Fish. Nate earned a degree from the University of Cincinnati at the New School University. Nate played baseball at the University of Cincinnati. And as a senior, he was captain of the Bearcats and set the conference USA record with six hits in a game. At the 2005 Maccabee Games, Nate played for Team USA and won a gold medal. Nate later was the head coach of the United States national team, which won a gold medal. In 2010, Nate co-founded and managed the Yorkville Baseball Academy in New York City. Nate was the starting shortstop for Israel in the 2014-2015 qualifying rounds for the 2016 European Baseball Championship. The team won the sea pool in 2014. He was an assistant coach for the Yarmouth Dennis Red Sox in the Cape Cod League and worked as a minor league coach for the Los Angeles Dodgers in 2019. Nate has played shortstop, third base, outfield, and catcher. He has won three medals at the Maccabee Games. He played for the Tel Aviv Lightning in the only year of the Israel Baseball League. He served as national director for the Israel Association of Baseball. Nate coached for the Israel National Baseball Team and 2013 and 2017 qualifiers for the World Baseball Cla Classic. From 2013 to 2016, Nate lives in Israel and worked as the national director for the Israel Association of Baseball. He made Aliyah 2013 to accept the position and spend his time visiting Israeli schools to introduce kids to baseball. While serving as director for Israel Baseball, Nate co-founded the program Le Kulam, Baseball for All, to bring Arab and Jewish kids in Israel together. Baseball Le Kulam was featured during the 2016 APAC conference in Washington, D.C. Nate also played professional baseball in Argentina, Puerto Rico, and the Dominican Republic. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce to you, Nate Fish, the king of Jewish baseball. Hey, guys. Thanks, David. That was pretty, that was pretty thorough right there. I don't think I even have to, I don't have to say anything. There were no <laughs> gaps in that. That was everything. <laughs> thank you. Um, no, thank you guys for having me. This is really cool. Um, it's exciting to see such a big group and, uh, you know, a bunch of Jewish baseball fans out there. I think, like you guys were saying before, from coast to coast and um, that share that common interest. Um, yeah, I mean, there is, you know, certainly a lot to cover. Um, I've been involved with, with uh, Israel baseball for over 15 years. Um, for, for you Boston Knights out there, uh, in 2007, there was a, a businessman from Boston named Larry Barris who started a professional baseball league in Israel that uh, it only lasted one year. In some ways, it could be framed as a failure because it, it, only, it didn't endure, but in some ways, it was a success because it was the beginning of this story for many of us that are still involved in Israel baseball um, that met one another. Eric Holtz, for example, um, we're going to the Olympics later this summer. We were, we were speaking about Holtz before we started recording here. He's managing the team. Um, and I'm, I'm the third base coach for the team. And Holtz and I were roommates in the Israel Baseball League in 2007. So even though the league failed and Larry sort of bore the brunt of the, of the failure financially um, after one year, it set this whole chain of events into motion that are still going on. Um, 
guys from that league are now on the staff from the Olympics and have had, you know, friendships that have gone, gone into the multi-decade range now. So, uh, that's one place we could sort of start the story. If we could go even further back sort of to the beginning, uh, and, and, and sort of go in chronological order. Um, I guess again, for you, for you Boston people out there, I'm originally from new England. There you go. Um, for you Red Sox fans. So I grew up a Red Sox fan also. My first games were at Fenway. Um, my mom is from Newton, Massachusetts. Some of you guys know, out there viewing know my mother, Marcia. Uh, my dad uh, is from the Bronx. Oh, I know her. There you go. You know, you know my mom? Yeah, I go to Temple Emanuel. The, the queen of all Jews. So, uh, huh. Huh. yeah. Um, so my dad's from the Bronx. My mom is from Boston. They met, uh, of all places, in Vermont. So I grew up in, in uh, Vermont and New Hampshire originally um, and was indoctrinated into Red Sox Nation as a young man. And like many young uh, people, after going to my first game at Fenway Park, I wanted to be a Major League Baseball player. Um, we eventually moved to Cleveland, and I sort of switched my allegiances to the, uh, the Cleveland Indians teams of the mid-'90s. Um, with Manny Ramirez and Jim Tomey um, that ended up going to the World Series. Those are such, such good teams. And inevitably, by virtue of living there, um, ended up sort of cheering for those teams. Um, but always was on these dual paths, you know, within our household. Judaism was always a thing. My mom uh, worked in the Jewish community in Cleveland. Um, she was the director of Hillel at Case Western University. Um, and obviously pursuing um, throughout my childhood and through high school and into college and even well after college, um, that, that initial dream of playing professional baseball. So there were, there were these dual threads in my life um, as like a regular Jewish kid, but also as a baseball player um, that sort of collided, I guess, uh, in 2005, when I went to play in the Maccabee games for the first time, it was my first time going to Israel to play baseball um, and start to meet the people in the baseball community in Israel um, that eventually uh, sort of brought me there um, to be the national director for Israel baseball many years later. Um, so following going for the first time in 2005 to the Maccabee games, like I said, Larry, had this crazy idea, Larry Barris had this crazy idea to start a professional baseball league in Israel in 2007. Um, whether it was a good idea or not, I will leave up to, to you guys. Um, it was a bit rushed for sure. Um, he imported 120 of us from nine different countries. Um, we went and we lived at, uh, it was a boarding school for, for kids with behavioral problems. And we lived in the dormitories there four to a room. It was not the accommodations we had all imagined. Um, it was called Kfar Hayarok, about 20 minutes north of Tel Aviv. Um, and we played, I think we played about a 45 game schedule. And so, you know, we completed a schedule. There was a, a successful opening night. There was a successful all-star game. There was a championship game. Um, so the league did have some appearances of success, but also Israel is just not, does not have the infrastructure to support a professional baseball league, does not have the fans, uh, does not have the facilities, virtually none of the players in the league. There were two Israelis on each team, but everyone else was just an import from America or the Dominican Republic. There was a dude from Japan. There were some guys from Colombia. Um, and so ultimately Israel is not was not and probably still is not prepared to support uh, a, any kind of a legitimate base professional baseball league. But um, it also sort of introduces this interesting concept when we're talking about baseball in Israel between you guys, I, I assume the sort of American baseball loving Jewish community and the Israeli community. And it's just not that much a part of the culture in Israel. And so American Jews assume, well, I know all these American Jews that love baseball. I'm sure the Israelis will love it too. They sort of underestimate how different Israel is from America and how hard it is to impact culture to sort of introduce this very American game to this very Middle Eastern country. Um, and many people have failed to bring baseball to Israel over the years, um, including Larry, unfortunately. So um, 
after the Israel Baseball League. Um, trying to think of what the next sort of major event. I think the, the next really, really, really big thing is that in 2012, Major League Baseball invited Israel to the World Baseball Classic. So um, for those of you guys that don't aren't familiar with the World Baseball Classic, it's basically the World Cup for baseball. And there's this very, very, very important critical rule in the World Baseball Classic that you do not have to be a citizen of the country that you play for. You only have to be eligible for citizenship of the country that you play for. So in the case of Israel, that means you had to have at least one Jewish grandparent to be eligible for Israeli citizenship to then uh, play for Team Israel. And there are, lucky for us, lots and lots of guys um, that fit that qualification that are playing major league baseball, minor league baseball, high level college baseball. So we were able to compile this huge list of American Jewish baseball players, um, many of whom are going to the Olympics with us this summer who have since made Aliyah. It sort of, again, was a, one of these early events that set a, lo a lot of other events into motion. Um, many of those guys have made Aliyah and are now Israeli citizens and are now going to the Olympics in, in, in uh, 2021, nine years later. But the 2012 Major League Baseball, as a total outside thing, decided to uh, invite Israel to the World Baseball Classic, even though our world ranking could not, did not justify the invitation really at all. Um, so in 2012, that means we had people like Brad Osmus was our manager. Um, Gabe Kapler was our bench coach. Uh, Brad and Gabe are both now uh, major league managers. Um, Jock Peterson played outfield for us. Some of you guys probably know Jock because he's been with the Dodgers for so many years. Um, but may not have known that he was Jewish. I'm not sure if he even knew that he was Jewish. That's sort of another funny thing about Team Israel for the World Baseball Classic. So simultaneously, as again, there's these two different communities, as there is the domestic, very grassroots, on the ground, baseball development going on in Israel, kids playing in little leagues and Tel Aviv and Beit Shemesh and all over the country. Um, there's simultaneously this sort of high profile group of Americans representing Israel on the world stage, guys like Jock and stuff like that. And there's this huge range um, of Jewish identity among that group of players. Some of them grew up like I did with like what could be considered like a pretty standard, you know, Jewish American upbringing um, with a little religious education and a bar mitzvah and everything like that. And some of the guys had virtually no connection to Judaism whatsoever. And this was really their introduction to a Jewish community. That community just happened to be um, a, a professional baseball team. So uh, in 2012, we were very, 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 very heavily favored. And we had all these big league guys and we were like, we're gonna just dirt roll all the guys in this tournament. Um, and we didn't, we ended up losing in the finals to Spain and did not make it out of the qualifying round into the actual uh, World Baseball Classic in 2013. And uh, Peter, our general manager, who's still the GM of the team, um, at the end of that tournament, sort of casually turned to me um, in the elevator and just said, hey, Fish, do you want to move to Israel and be the director for the baseball program there? And I, without thinking about it, said, no, not really. Because um, I hadn't really thought about, you know, sort of uprooting my life from New York City where I was living at the time, moving all the way to Israel, just to attempt this thing that I knew people had already been failing to do for many, many years, which is to popularize baseball in Israel and to give baseball in Israel the boost um, that it really needed to sort of crack into the mainstream of Israeli culture. But um, about six months later, I kept thinking about it and thinking about what a cool opportunity it was and called Peter back and said, uh, if, the, if the offer still stands, I'm ready to move to Israel. Um, ended up moving it later that year, um, getting Israeli citizenship, um, playing for the national team and sort of taking over the day-to-day -day operations of the Israel Association of Baseball, which meant, you know, basically just drastically trying to increase the number of people in Israel that care about baseball, that play baseball, that know about baseball, that are fans of baseball. So we started, uh, we started a baseball academy that was recognized by Major League Baseball 
for the top players that were under the age of 19 years old in the country. We started baseball Le Coulomb for uh, Arab Israeli and Jewish Israeli kids to play together. Um, and we started many, many, uh, you know, field development programs. There's only two baseball fields in Israel. So we could go, you know, as I go through this story piece by piece, we could probably spend a lot of time just on the details of the World Baseball Classic or just on the details of, you know, the, the domestic national team program and the program in Israel, things like how many fields are there, how many players are there. And, you know, as soon as I walk through this stuff, we can let your, your sort of curiosity guide the conversation a little bit, but just to fill in some of those blanks and give you an idea, um, there's about a thousand kids in Israel that play baseball in different age levels, just like there are in the States, you know, the little league, a juniors league, um, a men's league that is very, very, very shabby, eight or nine or 10 guys per team. Um, sometimes we play without, without one of the outfielders out on a soccer field or something like that. Um, there's only two legitimate baseball fields in the country. So you have to sort of, if you don't know anything about baseball in Israel and you're trying to, you know, get some kind of visual of it, it doesn't really compare to any baseball program that we're used to in the States. The equipment is worse, the fields are worse. Many times the players are worse. Um, and so I hope that gives you guys some, some picture. I'm glad to answer questions. So over the course of three years in Israel, we did through a lot, a lot of work from a lot of different people, increase the number of players in the country by about 20%. We started a lot of programs um, that put us a little bit more onto the international stage. Um, and it was time for the World Baseball Classic again. And again, we got very, very lucky to be invited to try and qualify this time, the World Baseball Classic, like the Olympics and the World Cup happens every four years. So we were invited again in 2016 to try to qualify. Um, this time the qualifier was in Brooklyn, New York at MCU Park, a virtual home game for us. Um, and we, we won the qualifier this time against uh, Great Britain and Pakistan, weirdly enough, and Brazil. And so we made it finally after four years many of the same guys that were on the team that had lost in 2012 <clears throat> and many guys who had really committed to doing this again four years later, including myself and including moving to Israel and becoming an Israeli citizen. It really changed the course of my life, came back together in 2016 to sort of correct the ship where it had gone wrong four years earlier. Finally won the qualifier. We were going to the World Baseball Classic. Um, and the following spring, we entered the World Baseball Classic. I think our world ranking was like 47th. And the first round was in Korea against Korea and the Netherlands and Taiwan, who were ranked like third, fourth, and ninth, respectively. Um, our, I think our odds in Vegas of winning the tournament were like 200 to one. We had, you know, we, were, we had the lowest world ranking by about 35 spots, I think. Um, and ended up winning that first round in Korea. We beat Korea at home. We beat the Netherlands, who had five uh, major league shortstops on one team, which is sort of an unusual thing, um, and, and, and beat Taiwan and won the first round and advanced to the second round in, in uh, Tokyo, Japan, where we're going again this summer. Um, we beat Cuba in the first game of the second round. And now we were like on this crazy sort of Cinderella story run um, there was a lot of media, you know, the headlines were coming out. What's going on? Is Israel going to win this tournament? The whole story sort of caught fire. And we had not only sort of righted the, the, the wrong from 2012, we had now like surpassed any like expectation from internally from the team um, or externally from the, from the baseball world that was watching. Um, which was a really, 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 really incredible experience. And again, I'm glad to answer questions about that and, and uh, that team and that experience and that tournament um, and that, that sort of moment that happened for us in 2017. Um, and now, again, four years later, we are, uh, I was actually, I spent two years, like uh, David, like you said in the, in the introduction, in the Cape Cod League. So at this point, just on a personal level, not talking so much about Israel baseball, I was sort of moving closer and closer and closer to finally getting into 
professional baseball in the States, which again was my childhood dream um, to play major league baseball. But now I said, I think I'm ready to start coaching in, in professional baseball. So I spent two years in, in the Cape Cod league, which is the top collegiate league in the country. Um, and was eventually hired by the Los Angeles Dodgers as a minor league coach um, in 2019. I finally, I was 39 years old by now, <laughs> and I had been bouncing around from league to league and country to country and experience to experience, uh, but finally cracked into professional baseball. Um, as I was working for the Dodgers, the national team was competing in Europe still, and Eric Holtz, whose name we've mentioned, was the head coach at this point for these very, very low level European championship tournaments, but they kept winning. They won the C pool, then they won the B pool, then they won the A pool, then they won this qualifier. They were winning four and five games at a time until they got all the way to the Olympic qualifier, won the Olympic qualifier. So as I'm working with the Dodgers, I'm talking to Holtzy and I'm watching the guys online and then, and, and they, they won the qualifier and were one of six teams to make it to the 2020 Olympics that are now taking place in 2021. So um, the next big event for this group of guys that have now been together for eight and nine years um, are the Olympics coming up. We have training camp in, uh, in May in Arizona for a couple of weeks. And then we have exhibition games throughout July before we go over to Tokyo again um, to play some exhibition games there. Um, and then for the opening ceremonies and the actual tournament to see if we can you know, it's a very, very, very small tournament. It's only six teams total um, to see if we can win a medal. It's the first uh, team from Israel that's going to the Olympics in 45 years. Uh, it is, you know, obviously a very, 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 very big deal um, for the players and coaches and this whole community of people that have been paying attention for, to Israel baseball for, the, for, you know, I mean, the last, like I keep saying about 15 years since we started popping up on the world stage a little bit more. Um, this is sort of a, a pinnacle, I think, for this, for this group of people. So um, yeah, that sort of brings us up to the present a little bit. I don't know if there are any questions that are popping up in the chat that you guys wanna start so we can sort of direct the conversation um, where, where people's curiosity lies. Um, I could certainly talk Israel baseball forever. Okay, uh, I had to unmute myself there. So yeah, I, I, it's a good question. Um, Stan kind of answered it already, but we'll hear it from you too. Why don't they build more fields in Israel? Don't they have Little League? Don't they have stuff going on there? Yeah, they're, they're, like I said, there's about a thousand kids that play in, in 15 different cities throughout the country, typically where there's like English speaking communities, you know, Americans have moved to Israel for however many years and sort of congregated together in certain communities uh, in Jerusalem and Beit Shemesh and Ranana and, and Tel Aviv, these little Anglo, more Anglo communities. Um, and so that's where the baseball communities are throughout the country. Um, you have to sort of wrangle up a lot of governmental support to build a baseball field in Israel or anywhere else. And for those of you guys that are fami more familiar with Israel, it's really, really, the bureaucracy is thick and the red tape and uh, the mayor doesn't understand baseball and this and that. There's just a lot of pieces that you have to put together to get something like that done, including needing a lot, a lot of money. So the first thing you have to do is raise a lot of money for a construction project of that size to build a, a baseball field and, and facility. Um, so between putting all these pieces together where you raise the money, you have the local governmental support you buy or long-term lease the land and then actually getting it done. It's just a really, really, really hard thing to do um, in a place where, like I said, baseball is not the first thing on everyone's mind. Um, and it's just proven to be a very, very, very difficult thing to get done. If anyone out there wants to give it a try, I can put you guys in touch with the right people. See if we can get some fields <laughs> built over there. There's two, there's two really, really good projects going on right now. They've already broken ground uh, for a baseball field in Beit Shemesh and they have the money for, and the support for one in Ranana. So we could double the number of fields in Israel pretty soon. That's good. <clears throat> I have a, a really good question. So you talked about traveling all over the world. How do you pay for that? It's expensive. 
they pay. That's the, one, one of the good things about working in baseball. You don't make a lot of money, but there's certain, there's some perks and stuff. And so um, whenever I've had to travel to, to play or coach, that's always part of the deal that the team pays for flights and housing and stuff like that. That's part of the, uh, part of the deal as a baseball player and coach when you are brought onto a team or onto a coaching staff. Um, and I've been very, very, very lucky to bounce from place to place. And I've uh, played uh, or, or coached in about, I think almost 20 different countries in the last 20 or so years. Who supports, like, where does the money come from? Is the government pay? Uh, yeah, I mean, in the case of the Olympics, we get some support from the Israeli Olympic Committee, but much, much of it comes from American Jews and, and fundraising efforts through um, JNF, Jewish National Fund, has something called Project Baseball uh -huh. that directly supports the Israel Association of Baseball. So they have, uh, huh. we're, we're actually launching a campaign, a fundraising campaign tomorrow. It's called the 25th Player. Um, we are bringing 24 players to Tokyo with us. And we want the number 25 to sort of represent the, the worldwide Jewish community that's going to be supporting the team in Tokyo. And so there's a there's a campaign that's starting tomorrow. Um, and the Olympic torch lighting, coincidentally, is this month on the 25th, two days from now. So corresponding with the torch lighting, we're launching a fundraising campaign called the 25th player for people to just raise awareness uh, about the team and about Israel baseball in general. Nate, who are the five other teams in the Olympics? Uh, there are four that have qualified already. Israel, Japan, Korea, Mexico. And there's two qualifying rounds coming up. So one team from the Americas. So the Americas qualifier will be USA, Canada, uh, Dominican Republic, probably Venezuela, a couple other teams. So one team will qualify out of that. And then the final qualifier will be in Taiwan. It'll be the top 10 teams in the world that have not already qualified. So let's say, for example, if the USA doesn't qualify out of the Americas qualifier, they'll have a second chance to do it out of that final qualifier. And that will happen in uh, uh, one, the America qualifier is happening in April. And then um, that final qualifying team is in June, right before the, the actual tournament. So I have a really, really important question that I can personally mm -hmm. relate to. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Will Mensch on a bench still be the mascot? I don't think so. Oh my God. I think that was a 2017 thing. Um, Cody Decker, who's like a very, very entertaining dude we have many characters on the team one of the interesting things about being on an all jewish baseball team is you have a bunch of weird guys on the team um more much weirder than you would normally find on like any professional baseball team so cody decker is one of those guys very entertaining dude has sort of a big media presence um and he brought the mensch in he's no longer with the team so i, I don't think we can take the mensch with us we're gonna have to find a new mascot Okay, well, I'm glad you cleared that up. You know, you can go on Shark Tank and, uh, you know, have the news. It was a, it was a good one. <laughs> so, uh, uh, <clears throat> I believe that baseball will not be in the next... This is from one of our uh, mm -hmm. attendees. He believes that mm -hmm. baseball will not be in the next Olympics. And if that's the case, will there be a greater emphasis on the World Baseball Classic? Good question. Yeah, so the, the, the World Baseball Classic, like I said, is every four years. So it was actually supposed to happen this year, but the Olympics got bumped one year. So they bumped the World Baseball Classic one year to 2022. Um, as far as the Olympics go, it just depends what country is hosting. Um, I think uh, they're in LA in 2028. So I imagine baseball will be back in. If it's a non-baseball, do we know where it is in 24? Paris. Paris? There's probably not a lot of good baseball fields in Paris. I've played in France a little bit, but never in Paris. But so it, baseball is a very hard sport to include in the Olympics. It's very easy to be like, we're going to add trampolining. And you bring over one semi-failed gymnast to jump on a trampoline in the same venue. It's one person. If you're going to include baseball in the Olympics, it's... 40, 50 people flying over there 
building stadiums, it's a huge undertaking to include baseball. It's much easier to do, you know, synchronized swimming or whatever. Um, more, more like a sub event from a, an already existing event. So in, when it's in LA in 2028 and we got Dodger stadium and stuff like that, I imagine that it will be in, um, I actually, in 2013, I flew to Tokyo to uh, cast the vote on behalf of Israel to get baseball back in the Olympics at this sort of like baseball world Congress event where there had to be a representative from each of the countries to make it official um, to get baseball back in. And so it's always this back and forth, this like juggling thing, you know, depending on what country it's in and what year it is sort of trying to figure out if baseball will or will not be an Olympic sport. Okay. So I have um, a late breaking news here. Uh, I was given some insider information for your replacement for Mensch of the Bench. Uh, my co-chairman, David Kravitz, mm -hmm. has just been nominated to be <laughs> your next mascot. Congratulations, <laughs> Mazel tov. Don't make it too Jewish. He doesn't like Jewish stuff too much. But Thanks, Danny. Welcome to the team. Yeah. You have to move out of Worcester, though. That's right. I can't do that. <laughs> so are you going to Tokyo? And there was a question that I'm interested in. Well, what's the protocols that the team will have for COVID? Because as we have now heard, no one from outside of Japan will be attending the Olympics. So that in itself is kind of weird. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it seems to still be happening this summer. Uh, as a uh, side note for you, most people on this call know, we were supposed to have a uh, convention live this summer and we are going virtual because even though we have a vaccine, we're still not there yet. So the question is, what are the, what are the protocols for COVID? Yeah, that's a good question. We're always getting updates. We get sort of this guidebook, like an email with like an updated guidebook about COVID from the Olympic Committee. Um, as of now, internally, we are trying to get all of our guys, uh, vaccinated. I think in the most recent protocols, not all of the athletes as, as mandated have to be vaccinated. You certainly have to have a negative test result and within the Olympic village and upon arrival, there's going to be a lot of testing going on. Um, I am not sure in the most updated version, if it's, if all the athletes have to be vaccinated, we internally within our team are all trying to get vaccinated prior to training camp in May. Um, so there's no surprises. It's already tricky enough because we got guys, some of guys are in, you know, minor league spring training. Some guys are, we're kind of scattered all over the place. It can be very tricky to get guys together. We don't really have a bubble as, as, people call it for this entire extended period and the only way we're really going to be able to guarantee um everyone's safety is is by getting everyone vaccinated so that's what we're trying to do right now okay thank you for that i have a good question here were you in the movie heading home i was briefly um so in 2007 um a good friend of mine named brett rapkin who's a really good filmmaker he made a movie called Holy Land Hardball that it sort of followed four players through um, the experience leading up to and going to Israel for the Israel Baseball League. That was called Holy Land Hardball. I was lucky I was one of those four players. And so I'm in that one a lot. Um, and then there was a film crew with us in 2017 for Heading Home. Um, and I'm in, I'm in that one a little. I, uh, I think I do an interview or two in that one. I don't think I'm one of the featured guys, but I pop up there a couple of times. It's excellent. And one of our uh, viewers tonight heard that Ian Kinsler will actually be playing for Israel. Is that true? Yeah. Ian's on the team. Um, obviously, I really, I mean, if you look around the infield, um, it's pretty good. Uh, Ryan LaVarnway behind the plate. He's got big league time. Wow. Danny Valencia. Uh, who has several years of major league experience at one of the corner infield positions, Ian at one of the middle infield positions. So those are good, really, really, really high level guys with good experience that are going to give us a chance to go into the games with a level of comfort that you don't really have. If you have a bunch of 24 year olds playing in the Olympics. Um, I think that Ian Kinsler um, 
and Danny and Ryan and other guys on the team that have, you know, playoff experience in the major leagues are not going to be rattled walking into a, an environment like that. And that's really important um, for just for setting the tone for, for some of the younger guys. Uh, question about the team. Will Dean Kramer, K-R-E-M-E-R, be playing for Israel? Um, Dino won't. He is an up-and-coming pitcher in the major leagues for the for the Baltimore Orioles. Um, and so the rule for the Olympics. So again, Major League Baseball runs the World Baseball Classic. And so they promote the idea of Major League Baseball players playing in that tournament. An organization called the WBSC, the World Baseball and Softball Confederation, they run the Olympics and they're somewhat competing uh, tournaments. And it's during the major league season. So anyone that's on a major league roster during the Olympics cannot compete in the Olympics. And Dean is definitely going to be one of the top end starters for the Orioles this year. Um, but a funny story about Dean, I've known Dean since he was like 14. Um, he is from Stockton, California, but his family is Israeli and he would spend a lot, lot, lot of time in Israel. He would spend summers there, speaks fluent Hebrew. He's very, very Israeli, even though he grew up in the States. Um, and so he came out to one of our national team practices when he was like 14. We were practicing in sport tech in Tel Aviv and uh, someone introduced him and said, hey, this is Dean, really good kid, really small. Maybe he'll play some high school baseball. Definitely not a pro guy, not going to be a prospect, kind of undersized outfielder. Um, two years later, I was coaching the, uh, the, uh, the uh, junior boys baseball team for the Maccabee games. And we had a tryout in LA and Dean came to the tryouts. And now he was like five foot 10 and he was throwing like 85, 86. And he started, he started you saw it. He wasn't playing outfield anymore. Now he was pitching. He was maybe a junior in high school, but he was still really small. Um, he certainly was not a pro prospect, even though I will say in my own credit, I started to see something in him. And he reminded me of a friend of mine that played in the major leagues for many years. And so I was able, I sort of had a, a little bit of an idea at this point that he was going to be good. Um, played some junior college baseball, kept growing, came and pitched for us for the national team because he was an Israeli citizen a couple of years later. Now he was playing college baseball and he's six foot three and he's throwing 92 and he gets drafted. And now he's 95, 96 um, in the major leagues for the Baltimore Orioles. Nice story. Nice. Yeah. So I'll give you more of a uh, autobiographical question. Uh, Nate, what's your greatest memories of playing or coaching baseball? That is a good question. And there are many, many, many of them. Um, you know, the 2017 World Baseball Classic, when we went on that run, we won four or five games in a row, was pretty special. Uh, it ended, unfortunately, when we were playing um, against Japan in the Tokyo Dome. And we we're at this point, we were so deep into the tournament. We were really severe underdogs. The pitching was really short. Um and we had thought we're going to win, we're going to win, we're going to win. At this point, we want to win, but we're definitely not expected to. And uh, it was a pretty special moment going out in the Tokyo Dome, and there were 55,000 fans there. It was really, 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 really loud. And the energy in the building was just really intense. And I, don't, I have experience playing and coaching in front of thousands of people but not tens upon tens of thousands of people and so that was a little bit different for me that's a memory that I always have but there's just so many little things you know as a player and coach and I know it's sort of a lame answer that's not that's not so specific but so many relationships and moments um, in so many different countries and you know, that, that stand out, but I'll, just as, as one specific moment going out on, on the Tokyo Dome in front of that crowd um, and, and being in a tie game into the fourth inning against them as the real, as, a, as severe underdogs was pretty cool. Great. So, so let's talk a little bit about you playing for Israel. So you represent uh, the state of Israel. And one of the questions that was asked was, do you guys keep kosher when you, especially when you are, not in Israel. 
Yeah. Um, so just on a personal level, I grew up not no pork, no shellfish. Um, that was just a household thing. So it was our own little version of kosher. I do not, I don't keep kosher at this point in my life, but as a, as a national team, this is sort of an interesting little anecdote. Um, so when we take the younger national team, it's the, the having a lot of observant religious Jewish kids in the national team program is very tricky. We can't play in tournaments that play on Shabbat. Um, or we have to bring additional players. We call them Shabbat players. Kids that are not as observant that can play on Shabbat so that the kids that don't play on Shabbat can walk to the field to watch the game, but not dress and play in the game. Even though some of the religious kids get certain permissions from certain rabbis to play in the game. So the juggling act of religion and baseball within the program in Israel is very, very, very tricky. But one of the things we always do is we travel with an extra equipment bag. So we have like the catcher's gear and the bats and the helmets and all the stuff you would normally travel with. We also bring a bag of kosher pots, pans, plates, and everything for the kids. We always find a Chabad house in Prague or whatever city we're traveling to for the tournament and make sure to get the kids there for Shabbat dinner and whatever dietary need that the kids have, we travel with food and plates and pots and everything to make sure that everyone's taken care of, which adds a whole nother layer of complexity to something that's already pretty hard to do, which is running a baseball team and traveling around the world with them um, and dealing with an issue that none of the other, everyone else is just trying to win baseball games. We're trying to win baseball games and satisfy the needs and uh, the dietary and religious needs of the kids that are, are, are more religious. So that's a little, a little snippet as it pertains to, to keeping kosher on the team. Great. <clears throat> so I have a lot of questions for you about who's going to be playing, who's going to be playing. So is Brown, who is retired, will he be playing? Will Ty Kelly be playing? And here's a question. I, I guess I'm supposed to understand it, but I'm sure you will. Did you ever meet the left arm of God when you coached in the Dodgers system? <laughs> So, so, so those are all your specific uh, questions. No, that's cool. Ty, Ty Kelly's on the team. Ty was also with us in uh, 2016 and 2017. Played for the Mets uh, in the big leagues. Between, was it just with the Mets? He might have been with someone else also. Um, but uh, played in the big leagues. He has parts of a couple seasons in the major leagues. Ryan Braun has not been a part of the team before. I think his father's Israeli. I think Braun may actually have Israeli citizenship and is transitioning. It looks like, I don't know if it's public or it's been announced, but I've seen it announced recently that it, he looks like he's transitioning into retirement, which would make it an interesting scenario. But um, there's nothing sort of official to report about him being on the team. Um, and I believe the left hand of God is Sandy Koufax, who uh, – there's a lot of one of the funny things is throughout my life in in and my baseball career there's a lot of really 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 crazy and lucky opportunities and coincidences one of them is that um sandy koufax also played at the university of cincinnati where i played um and one of my teammates at the university of cincinnati it probably bears mentioning was kevin euclid who's probably the most well-known jewish player of our generation or of my generation um and that those are those are both very 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 wild coincidences. But uh, no, I, I haven't met Koufax, but he uh, he sent us a text message before one of the games. He said, "Tell the boys I said good luck." He didn't send it to me; he sent it to one of the other guys on the staff that he's friends with. And and uh, we sort of looked at the phone and said, "You know, Sandy Koufax, tell the boys I say good luck." So that was a, a cool, an exciting moment for the coaching staff that we shared with the players. Great, great, yeah. So. Uh, Kevin Euclid, uh, I'm getting several texts here. We've been trying to get him on one of these things. So if you happen to ever be, you know, speaking to the guy, we're, sure. we're, we're really nice. We'd love to have him. <laughs> yeah, no, we're still, I talk to him a lot. We're still good friends. I'll, I'll mention it. That would be awesome. Awesome. So um, along those lines, Sandy Koufax, et cetera, et cetera, one of the questions is, what's the biggest name that you've ever met and gotten to hang out with in baseball? 
Oh, I mean, over the years, there's a lot. Oh, there was one there. I was at winter meetings one year. Winter meetings is sort of the big off season convention in, uh, that happens in, in the baseball industry. And we were getting ready for the World Baseball Classic. So we had to be there. And I was with Jerry Weinstein, who is a big name himself um, in baseball. He was managing the team in 2017. He's managed, yeah, not managed, but he's coached in the major leagues for the Colorado Rockies. He's sort of like a legendary coach uh, within, within baseball. And we had lunch with like Jim Leland and Omar Vizquel and Moises Alou. And it was just like, I think, I don't remember if Joe Torre was there. Just this group of like really legendary baseball people that were all there because we were, they were all, Leland was coaching the USA for that tournament. Um, and they were all involved in the tournament. So that was a, quite a table to be at. There were a lot of big names there. That's great. So anyone else have any questions before we wrap this up? Because the chat is, I think I, here's your chance, guys. I have, I have one for you, Nate, actually. Um, so you were the co-founder of Lir Kulam. Can you tell me about, tell us about that? I'd love yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. No, it was a really, a really cool program. So of all the thousand-ish kids playing baseball in Israel, none of them were Arab Israeli kids, really. Um, like I said, they were Jewish, Jewish Israeli kids in mostly these Anglo sort of communities that exist around the country. And um, myself and a lot of other people within the organization thought it was important that we sort of break down that barrier and offer baseball, not only to the Jewish kids, but also to the Arab kids. Right. And also saw it, baseball as an educational tool where you can, it's not like the, the Jewish kids didn't really know anything about baseball either. The Arab kids didn't either. We could bring them together and teach them something together where they could play by the same rules and have this common interest. Um, and, and where we could use baseball basically as an educational tool, not to develop major league baseball players, but just to create, um, create connections between communities that need that and that have no, have very little interaction otherwise. So what we would do is it was just not easy. I mean, trying to identify kids and get permission to have them uh, do overnights together. And just, it, it took a, a really a lot of work to get the whole thing started, but we would go and get schools and community leaders in different communities to um, bring a group of about 15 kids together um, Arab Israeli kids, we do the same thing with Jewish Israeli kids. They'd come together, we would play baseball, have some games, have some meals. They would spend the night at the field uh, in the dormitories by one of the fields in Israel, um, wake up, play again the next day, spend about a total of 24 hours together. And then everyone would just jump on the bus and they'd go back to their communities and we would do it three times a year with the same group of kids. So they really got to know each other well and some of them formed relationships and friendships that are still going on today um and so that was a really really cool way nothing to do with high level baseball it was just about kids um and trying to make some progress um you know in on the ground in israel and that program got some attention too and it's still going on i don't think that they do the overnight component anymore but they certainly bring the kids together each year a group of 30 kids is selected to be part of the program what language do you speak when you're doing English, Hebrew, Arabic, kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah, I mean, we had, so I'm, I'm speaking English. My, my Hebrew is pretty bad, but I uh, I would speak English. We would have Hebrew translators, we would have Arabic translators and people, not only translators, like people that they knew and, and sort of parental type figures from each of the communities to help translate and communicate and just make everyone feel comfortable. Um, but yeah, it was a that program took a lot of figuring out for sure. So then I assume on the team you're playing, coaching now on the Israeli uh, Olympic team, you speak English. Is there translators or is pretty much just everyone speaks English? Everyone speaks English, even the, so uh, this is, that's a good question. So to give you guys a sense of the sort of breakdown on the Olympic team, there's 20, it's a 24 man roster. Like I said, 20 of the guys are American Jews that have made Aliyah. Four of the guys are Sabras, they're, they're Israeli, Israeli, grew up in the baseball program there in Tel Aviv or Kibbutz Gezer or wherever they're from. Um, but even those guys speak English. It's like one of the things we would always say in trying to promote the baseball program 
in Israel is like it's free English lessons on top of your kid gets to learn how to play baseball and they're also going to learn English because basically the language of baseball is English. Um, and so all the guys that even the guys that grew up in Israel that are on the team are totally very, 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 very Americanized. Most of them played college baseball in, in the States and have lived in the States at some point. Right. I have one more question. So you played on the University of Cincinnati with you and Kevin Euclid. You must have had a phenomenal baseball team. Yeah, we were good. We, uh, it's funny when you're that age, you don't have so much of a sense of it, but um, yeah, we still have the um, record for wins in a single season at the University of Cincinnati. I think the four, Kevin was one year older than me. Um, so that period of time when he was there and into my senior year was like the, the, the best window as far as wins go that the program has ever had. So yeah, it was a, we, we were pretty good. You guys were at the NCAA's? Uh, no, we were. We played in Conference USA, which was a very, very good baseball conference at the time, uh, with Houston and Tulane and Louisville and East Carolina and Texas Christian University and other schools. Um, we finished as good as I think third in the in the league, and you know we'd get votes for like the top twenty five every week, but we yeah. never kind of cracked into the top twenty five. Um, or, or the field of 64, um, besides playing in the conference championship game one year and getting very, very, very close every year and not, and not quite making it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yep. You need anything else, Dan, before I wrap it up? I, I got a question I'd like to ask. Is it, uh, do the people, is, as far as that, do they all have to be Jewish or can they be uh, Israeli Arabs too? Great question. And, and then, of course, by the same token, are there any Arab uh, ch uh, children that might, or do you foresee? That yeah, so any um, anyone that's Israeli, regardless of their, their religion um, or their background, um, is eligible to play for Team Israel, certainly. We happen to have all Jewish guys, and that's historically been who plays baseball in Israel, but we've made, like we were talking about before, we've really made an effort to try and cross some of those lines um, and would love, love, love for an Arab Israeli kid to emerge and play college baseball or be um, a, like, a, like a superstar that everyone could look up to. Um, so right now it's a bunch of Jewish guys, but we would love for any um, Israeli citizens to represent the team and for more and more Israeli citizens. I mean, we need the ratio to sort of shift as we go through time here to fewer American Jews on the team and more actual Israelis on the team. I think that would be a really good um a really good signal that that uh, about about growth in, in baseball in Israel. So I, I have a question, or I would think I, I would think it's a little more difficult with to get true Israelis because when they're eighteen, they go into the army. Mm -hmm. Do you find yeah. that to be an obstacle, or for, yeah. as far as this yeah, yeah, is yeah. concerned? Yeah, we we absolutely we uh. So th this is another one of these crazy obstacles. In trying to run a baseball program in Israel, you spend four or five or six years developing a kid, and then he just sort of disappears, goes to the army, maybe reemerges when he's 21, maybe not, uh, may have lost interest, maybe going to college, maybe doing a bunch of different things, but you lose three really critical developmental years on the field. Um, we have a program called Sport Haim, where uh, several kids in that age group every single year do not have to go serve and they have limited military service and their national service is to play baseball for the national team and to continue to train. And so those kids spend oh. more time with the coaching staff. They're called sport or sport And they don't have to go into full-time military service. They have nominal jobs at local bases where they do a few hours a week, but most of their national service is playing baseball for the national team and training and so you have to communicate with the government again on that about that program as far as reporting to them about their progress and how they're sort of uh, what they're doing and their chances of going and playing overseas. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Mr. Fish, do you know Charles Steinberg? Red Sox vice president. No, I don't think I know him. Maybe well, someone, I'm sure someone from our organization knows him, but I don't know him personally. 
Okay. Okay. So Nate, right. that so so Danny, I just, it's, it's Tom. I just want to tell a quick story. Okay, Tom, um, go for it. Go for it. About about Nate. My son was in Israel the year that the base the, the, the Israel baseball league played. Fellow graduate of Shaker Heights High School, and he's waiting around after a game. And he just goes up and introduces himself to Nate, and Nate gave him a ball, a game used ball from the, the Israel baseball league. So I, he comes home, and I said he didn't autograph it. He said, "Oh, I forgot to ask him." So Nate, if you ever get back to Cleveland, let me know. I got a I got a game used ball here waiting for your signature. I got you, Tom. I got you, man. Well, Nate, this was just fantastic. First of all, thank you, Tom for uh, recruiting Nate for us. It was just another fantastic uh, speaker um, for our, I'm gonna hand this over to Mr. Kravitz. Sure. Mr. Kravitz is probably gonna tell you that if you like this one, you, we just, have two more coming in the just, next two weeks. Just wait, just wait. If you, this is good, just wait. I don't know how we can top this one though. Okay, well, okay. How can we get in touch with Nate Fish? Nate, Where's, how can they get in touch with you? Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, I have put myself out into the world of social media, probably shamelessly. I, I have a blog called uh, kingofjewishbaseball.com that you guys can check out. Um, King of Jewish Baseball on Instagram, on Twitter. Um, so I'm very, very reachable through, through all of those channels. We also have his email. So if you guys really want to, you can go through myself yeah. or David and we'll... Oh, we have his email. We'll filter that through to yeah. uh, to Nate. Okay, uh, so I'd like to thank uh, Danny, my uh, my co-chairman, Elliot Feldman, our chairman, and I want to thank everybody for joining us this evening, and especially thanks to Nate Fish, King of Jewish Baseball. Absolutely phenomenal presentation. I mean, I, I just I was I'm sitting here just fascinated listening to your life and all the different things you've done. And I'm sure it's just the tip of the iceberg of all the things you, you've done, you've accomplished in your life. So it is a real honor to have you here today. I, I'm really, really happy you were here. Our uh, next of Sports Affinity event will be next Wednesday, and that will be March 31st. And we will have Lynn Elmore, basketball analyst and basketball, basketball legend. He will be here. Um, so if any of you'd like to uh, present, have an idea about sending a program, somebody you'd like to present a program, my email is there. Please do not hesitate. It's dbkravitz at msn.com. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you at our next program. And if you enjoyed our program this evening, please make a contribution to FJMC by going to fjmc.org. Hey, hey, David, yeah. David, that's next week. What about the following week? Oh, uh, next week and the week after that, we have Jake Fisher. He is a ESPN bas basketball uh, sports writer. So, so, so we're chock full, and that really a lot of this work and a lot of this credit does go to David Kravitz. He works tirelessly, and I think we've done over 20, 20 of these sports ones now, and they've all and it's been a year. So they've all been ones just as good as, as the other. They've all been home runs, literally. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you next. Hak Sameach, everyone. Hak Sameach to everyone. Hak Sameach. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Hak Sameach. Nate, thank Hak you very much. Hak everybody. Give my best to your parents. Okay. Great.